Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. He took me up to his little makeshift uh, kind of museum that he had of his personal artifacts. And uh, he had a picture of him, Fidel Castro, and Ernest Hemingway standing together, uh, ball with their rods in their hands. Uh, it was a, a Marlin tournament that they went over for. And uh, Ernest and Fidel were fishing together and apparently invited Lefty to join them. And uh, it, was a, it was a really cool little story. That was James Thule with another amazing Lefty Cray story. The Trout and Salmonid Library, Bud Lilly, Bozeman, and Lefty today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. We're wrapping up the big giveaway to the Skeena Spay Lodge uh, this summer, and we're announcing the winner tonight live on Facebook. If you want to check it out, wetflyswing.com slash live, and you can find out who won if you entered or if. If you jump on live, we always give away some bonus products as well for people that are on there. So check it out, wetflyswing.com slash live. Today's episode is sponsored by Maverick Fly Fishing. They make the lightest Euro nymphing reel in the world, which makes your rod more sensitive, casting more accurate, and you can hold your dead drifts longer without shoulder burn. Check out Maverick Fly Fishing Stinger and their other Euro nymph products and support this podcast by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash maverick right now. That's maverick, M-A-V-R-K, wetflyswing.com slash maverick. Check out the lightest and most unique Euro nymphing reel right now. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who you know from their game-changing telescopic fly rod roof rack systems. But did you also know that Trestle just released the only universal bike rack system designed exclusively for the angler and outdoorsman? You can check out this new universal rack system at wetflyswing.com slash Trestle right now to see their full line of gear carrying products and the artist series apparel. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. James Thule is here from Montana State University to share his angling stories and one of the most interesting and one-of-a-kind trout libraries in the country. We find out and uh, discover how this massive trout and salmonid library got started, who James has interviewed over the years, some pretty amazing, famous people, and, uh, and what the future of the potential podcasting uh, and the podcast might look uh, for the Angling History uh, Museum here. We're going to check it out. Plus, we hear the story of how James built his off-the-grid home from scratch in Montana. Here we go. James Thule from the MSU Angling Oral History Project. How are you doing, James? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on here. Um, we've been, uh, I think, probably a lot of people that maybe that don't know about what you have going. You essentially have uh, an archive of fishing. And, I mean, it's not only fishing. It's... Um, how would you explain the, you know, what you have going, the angling oral history project and everything at MSU? Sure. So our project actually started with our trout and salmonid collection. So we have the world's largest collection of books on trout and salmon. That was started with one of our former deans, Bruce Morden, and uh, Bud Lilly. They were the ones that planted the seed for that idea. Uh, we're such a, a fishing destination. We have so many anglers and uh, authors in our area that we thought it would be a good thing. So right now we have the largest collection of books on trout and salmonids, including a book signed by Isaac Walton. Uh, we have the first book to ever mention fishing in the new world, um, approaching 20,000 volumes overall now. And uh, then these other projects kind of sprouted from there. So we have a digital trout art collection. Uh, we have our archives. We have the largest collection of archival material on anglers. So we have like the papers of Dave Hughes, Bud Lilly, Nick Lyons, uh, John Garrock, Ed Engel, uh, et cetera. The list, AK Best, the list goes on. Several years ago, oh, probably a decade or more ago, a little bit, uh, Bud was telling me a story um, about this, about a guy that he had taken fishing in the, I believe it was in the eighties. And I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. I believe it was on the Madison. It was an older gentleman and, um, uh, they were, the fish were rising. It was perfect for fishing. The guy really couldn't walk that well anymore. Couldn't get around that well, but he could still cast, couldn't really see that good. And, uh, 
Bud directed him to cast into some uh, some Rising Browns, and uh, he landed one. And as Bud was releasing the fish, uh, he turned around, and the guy was taking apart his rod. And Bud's like, you know, the fish are still rising. We can catch more fish. And he said, no, that's as fine as fish of it as I've ever caught, and it's the <laughs> last one I'm ever going to catch. Oh, and wow. uh, he died just a couple weeks later. But wow. it really struck me that – it, for myself too, fishing has been important to me my whole life, and it's something that's kind of in my blood, and it obviously was with this gentleman as well. And uh, it occurred to me that we should be recording these type of stories and uh, preserving them for future anglers and learning about the culture of angling as well. So that's how the Oral History Project got started. Wow, that's really good. And what uh, what year was that when it got started? That was about 12 years ago. Oh, 12 years ago. Wow. So 12 years, and it's 23 now, so that was essentially 2011. Right around there. Yeah, right around there. Do you remember when you started? Do you remember were there, uh, I mean, I know there were podcasts around. Were you thinking like this oral history was, you know, kind of, did you think about the podcasting as, as you were doing it, or how'd that look? I mean, podcasts were, were something that we explored. One of the things that I really wanted to do is um, Paul Shaleri and I really worked on this, on developing this. And one of the things I really wanted to do was video record the interviews. And part of the reason for that was as humans, we, we convey so much information through our body language. And uh, I really wanted to be able to show somebody's face when they tell these stories. And uh, so that was why we went with the video. But uh, yeah, no, it's been a great, it's been a great run. That's right. That's right. And and now, and I know we'll put a link out at uh, wetflyswing.com slash MSU for Montana State University. Well, that'll redirect them over to the Angling Oral History Project. Uh, Correct. Which shows, you know, everything you have doing. And there's a search thing there, right? So you could search for anybody. Absolutely. So when people click that, they open up a, basically it has a video. So everything's, you can watch it on the website, right? That's pretty Correct. much how it works. Yeah. Okay. And so there's not a, there's not necessarily like a YouTube channel to go to. It's all right on the website. Correct. It is all right on the website. Yep. We've got, uh, we're just uploading a bunch, a bunch more videos in total. We've done around 370 interviews with anglers from around 65, 70 countries on, uh, um, six continents. And uh, part of the thing that we're doing right now is making them all AODA accessible. So we're adding transcripts to all the interviews. There you go. There you go. And I see, yeah, you have a, a long list. And remind me again, how many total interviews uh, have you done? Around 360, 370 total interviews. Yeah, 360. And then you're doing those. How how often are, the, are you doing a new, are they popping out there on the website? So we kind of, we'll go in waves. I'll, I'll go on a trip and I'll do... 20 interviews on a trip or something like that. Um, so they come in spurts. They come in spurts. Does it seem like after doing 360 of these that you find um, it's hard to uh, find new people? Because I imagine you're trying to find the best of the best. Is that true or do you have a mix? So it is absolutely a mix. We certainly do want to focus on, we do get the the Bud Lilies and, uh, you know, the John Garricks and the, the Nick Lines and things like that. But I'm real interested in also hearing from the average anglers. So that's, I have done interviews on the sides of rivers in Sierra Leone and India and uh, all over the world with, with subsistence anglers, people who have spent their entire life fishing the rivers for a living. Peru, just uh, all over the world. And uh, I think their stories are as important to document, if not more important than, than other folks, just because there's not a lot of people out there collecting that information and documenting their experience with, with angling. And uh, the global culture, I think, needs that larger representation of kind of the, the rock stars and, you know, the average Joes like me. And do you have some people on there that you're thinking like, hey, these are people we would love to have on, but maybe they just not, you know, maybe they're just uh, kind of the big superstar just haven't been on yet. Or are there any on that list, that bucket list? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there's certainly some folks on there that uh, uh, Paul and I have never done an interview. I'd really like to get to, to catch Paul one of these days. Skip Morris is somebody I'd like to interview. Um, there's quite a few folks that uh, I'm absolutely still interested in interviewing. Yeah, and I'd like some more representation. One of the things that, we've really worked to do is uh, 
to make sure it's not just a bunch of old white guys like me that are telling their stories. So we like to make sure that we have women represented, uh, you know, uh, folks of all races and backgrounds represented in this because fishing really is a global culture and uh, all our voices should be heard in, in kind of recording that history. That's right. That is a challenge too, isn't it? With, with women, do you find that, do you have any idea out of those 360, how many uh, are women? I don't have a solid number off the top of my head, but I would, I would, I would throw, probably throw in ten to fifteen percent. Uh, we've really we've done our best to kind of seek out women, and uh, certainly when I travel, I've always I've always done that, and we've had some great interviews on the road. I I've uh, I interviewed. It was in Cambodia. I interviewed a woman who uh, runs a small fly shop there, but uh, uh, part of the stories that she told too about were about her parents living through the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot. So it's it's always interesting to get these kind of background history stories about that connect angling to kind of life and the things we go through. People that I interviewed in in Germany uh, talked about having to sneak hooks and rods and things like that. Um, you know, when the, when the Berlin wall was still in effect. So, right, right. Yeah. And we're similar just as far as women. I mean, I think we have about the same 10% or so, right. Of, of women in our, just in our listenership. And probably it's about the same. I think we have a similar number of interviews on our show. So yeah, it's not easy. It's something I think about a lot, but it just seems like, right. It's even though you talk here about the 50, 50 and all that stuff, it seems like it's still a challenge, right. Trying to get equal numbers of all this. It absolutely is, yeah. And I don't know that we'll ever necessarily get equal numbers, but but we definitely want representation. We want as as many and as a, as diverse of voices like yourself and in, in the podcast here, you know, represented to really kind of represent for you or your full audience and for us to represent the kind of full cultural history. And do you ever get do you get people that kind of reach out to you and just say, Hey, we'd love to, I'd love to be on your show. This is what I do. Do you get that occasionally? occasionally absolutely yeah um i do get people that uh i'll meet i i'll go to conclaves or to conferences and things like that and uh they'll you know have a story to tell or they'll say you should really talk to my mother or my father or my brother or i've got a friend who has a you know has been running a fly shop for the last 30 years you should really speak with him about it and uh so that's great i mean one of the one of the ways that this really has grown is through that word of mouth people connection you know people telling me about other people that have stories to share yep exactly nice well let's maybe uh, broaden it out a little bit to the bigger picture uh, and maybe just take us back to montana state university and talk about um maybe first where that is for those that don't know because we have listeners kind of all around the country um where is Montana State? And then talk about what what this oral history, the kind of what you do on a daily, weekly basis. Sure, absolutely. So uh, Montana State University is located in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. So uh, some of the best trout country in the world, I would argue. We've got some great blue ribbon streams, some more close to not far from Yellowstone Park, not that far from Glacier, and uh, just have some in- incredible fishing opportunities for uh, for trout and salmon, it's including our, our native cuts and uh, native and native trout. Um, and uh, so that and that was, as I mentioned earlier, that was really the kind of the impetus for, for starting this this collection. There was that we were kind of in the middle of you know dreamland for for trout fishing country. So we thought it was a, a good mix idea that that somebody could come in and uh, read about a place that they've wanted to fish and then actually go out and, and dip their toes in the water. Um, one of the collections that we, we just have received from a, a pretty prominent author. That was one of the things that we talked about when, when he decided to give us his, his archival material was the idea that you can really connect place with the, with the writings by uh, being right there in Montana on a, on a daily basis. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, the special collections librarian in MSU. Uh, most of the work that I do is is directly involved with our Trout and Salmon collection. So doing interviews um, is certainly part of my job, and then uh, collecting materials. So as I mentioned, we we have the you know we have a pretty large book collection on on angling, and that is 
my old Dean Bruce used to call it the six degrees of trout and salmon. So we create, we collect anything that relates back to those species. So we're not a fly fishing collection, but we have a wealth of material on fly fishing and fly tying, building rods, all that kind of good stuff. But we'll have things on salmon sharks. We'll have things on dam removal. We have poetry. We have literature. We have anything that will connect back to those species. Our goal is to be the most comprehensive research center in the world for anything related to trout and salmonids. So anything that connects back, we will collect and preserve that material on. Um, game laws. Uh, game laws are a, a really interesting thing. We have game laws going back to the 1700s. And uh, it's from a research perspective, I always think they're really cool. I mean, you can track invasive species through them so and i know i know people don't like to think of uh rainbow brookies and browns as invasive but in a lot of places they are right um but uh the idea of being able to track when was the brook trout population in montana large enough and healthy enough to be regulated or the browns and you can do that through game laws and that's that's pretty interesting you can really track the health of a body of water through bag limits and uh it's uh it's it's one of the cool little kind of mini collections i guess in the larger collection that i really like and just kind of getting those odd government documents on uh on canning salmon in the 40s or or something like that we had one one from alaska that's just on that and uh, i always thought it was interesting because people are dying from improperly canned fish and we have this material that shows them how to properly can it um so I do a lot of a lot of work with that, a lot of work with toners, a lot of work with uh, seeing what new material is out there, kind of hunting for older books, things to fill in our collections. Uh, one of the things that's always really tough is uh, with periodicals. So we, I think we have around 500 or so different periodical titles, uh, so magazines, journals, and things like that. But people hang on to books. You know, you 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 read a book, you put it back on your shelf, you have it there for forever in a day you might pass that on to your children uh magazines we we tend to use you know you leave in the bathroom you leave in your car when you're done with it you kind of toss it out and so many publishers have changed hands so many times now that filling in gaps on periodicals is one of the more difficult things that i i try to do but uh, what we're looking for is to have a complete run of every periodical that we have um and nothing's more frustrating for a researcher to oh i know this article is published in this you know the june 1976 issue and, and they come in and we have everything but the june 1976 issue so right 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 that's cool so, yeah so you guys have i mean essentially and this is everywhere this is not just the the u.s this is kind of worldwide anything trout or some on its that is absolutely true. We uh, we collect on a global nature, so we have materials that are uh, French, Russian, uh, German, Latin, you name it. Um, we we get periodicals from Italy, from Poland, from France, uh, all over the world. Um, we'll collect that information and document it and keep it. Gotcha. And would people be able to, like if somebody was listening here, could they, uh, how would they track, would they be able to read some of this or look online or how does that look? Or do you, could you go in person? Of course. Yeah. So we are a land grant institution. So anybody can come in through our doors and use any of the material that we have available. Uh, we will through your local library, you can request an interlibrary loan and we will digitize any material you'd like us to digitize and send you a digital copy of that. Um, several of our, Archival collections, uh, Dennis Proper, Bud Lilies, uh, Nick Lines. We have several that are that are digitized, or we're working on digitizing, and that is an ongoing process. We hope to eventually digitize all of our archival collections, just to be able to make them available to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Uh, but for our printed material, yeah, it's you can always come in and kind of browse the stacks and check things out. And I certainly encourage you if you are coming out to bozeman or or the general area to to get a line in the water for some for some bull trout or some cuts or some rainbows or browns to uh um let me know to reach out and i will be happy to provide you with a tour of our collections i will let you hold in your hands a book that was signed by isaac walton so you really? can, you can hold in your hands something oh, wow. that isaac walton held in his 
That's pretty amazing. <laughs> so is that your is that one of the items that it's and that's the one you just got right? Is that one of those ones that's just um, it's kind of at top of the list of things you have there? That is, yeah, we had a donor several years ago who I, I gave a tour to, um, a really nice gentleman, and uh, he had collected some pretty rare books. And uh, as he was uh, kind of getting up in years, he uh, gave me a call and he said, I'm sending you some things. They belong there. And uh, this was one of the items he sent us. Um, that's one of our cooler items. One of the things I always like to pull out, we've got some really cool old uh it's like animal encyclopedias that were done in the late 1500s early 1600s and i love showing those to people they'll have pictures of uh griffins and unicorns and uh uh things like that alongside with you know hippos and and other other creatures and then the fish diagrams especially the old woodblock cuts are and the engravings are so incredibly detailed i the uh, the hours that people spent to document what these uh creatures of the deep look like from both uh external and internal perspective is is really really interesting but uh yeah no we've got some great gems we've got some really really cool things we've got uh books signed by presidents and and authors and uh, uh lots of famous folks so you always have that intrinsic value of it belonging to somebody famous or being present somewhere um and then the, the informational value. And of course, what we as a research library are always focused on is the informational value. We want to provide that first and foremost. Well, we have a lot of rare books. Uh, as I mentioned, we have, uh, I think I mentioned, we have a copy of the first book to ever mention fishing in the new world. I think that was published in 1521. And uh, that's a that's a pretty cool item. It's a letter uh, documenting fish in Rome, but uh, I think it was uh, written by a bishop. And just in passing, they mentioned the reports coming back from the New World of the abundance of fish. But uh, it's a pretty cool item to be able to, and I just think it's neat to be able to hold in your hand something that's been sitting on somebody's bookshelf for five hundred years. Right. But, uh, yeah. But so there's there's probably no real substitute for that, you know, visceral in-person experience of being able to smell that paper and see those books. But if you want copies of anything that we have, um, you can always reach out to me directly and uh, I'll be happy to help. And then again, your local library should offer interlibrary loan. You can make a request and we will uh, go ahead and digitize that and send it right off to you. There you go. So you can do that. So literally, if somebody found something, that's always a question too, like you said, with periodicals or anything, you know, you want to get something, it's not there. So they could just go in, either call you or search. And if they find it, you could send them it digitally for free. Absolutely. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is even better than I was thinking. This is a, a full, yeah. I mean, obviously it's, it's a library and it's, and I was just looking at one, I'm looking at your alphabetical list of like topics and the American Museum of Fly Fishing is one of them. So it looks like yeah. you've had some interviews. That's one of those things because there's other, you know, uh, resources out there. Do you find that there's other similar universities that are doing something like what you guys are doing? Maybe not quite as big, but similar? So there are absolutely other places out there that have amazing fishing collections or fly fishing collections. Um, there's no other library that I'm aware of that focuses on the species like we do. But uh, we do work really well with other institutions. So uh, we have we just finished a project with the American Museum of Fly Fishing where they had a bunch of uh, interviews that had been conducted quite some time ago. Um, and a lot of them were on, on audio cassette. And uh, they were sitting in their archives. But that is, I'm, I'm certainly old enough to remember having a, having a cassette player in my car and recording songs off the radio and things like that when I was younger. But, uh, but people don't have that anymore. So the, that's one of the things with an archive is uh, not only do you have to keep that material, so old floppy disks and things like that, but you have to keep the material, the, the machines that will allow you to access that information. Um, and audio cassettes and things like that, they weren't built to last. Uh, they're under constant stress, um, a track, anything with a tape. So it is, uh, it will fail eventually. So what we did anyway, with the project with them was we made an agreement and it was, it was, it worked out great for everybody. Uh, they sent us, sent us these 
rare, unique uh, uh, interviews. So it's kind of one of a kind things. And uh, we took them and we we worked with our student workers and, and myself and some other professionals who oversaw the project and we digitized everything. So we sent them back both the originals and then digital versions of them. And then we included the digital versions in our project. And so we were able to access information. Some of the folks there were, were no longer around. So we were able to get those interviews included in our larger project. And for them, we were able to help take information that was somewhat inaccessible and make it much more accessible. So it was a win-win. We've had great re relationships with... Uh, certainly with it with uh ffi and tu and other organizations as well so yep yeah yeah that's right yeah and i'm looking now you got T U, yeah esther uh, lily i guess that's oh, yeah. yeah but lily's wife i'm assuming yeah, yeah. and uh, alan baker um and yeah a whole bunch like you said 360 uh interviews right Th these are all interviews you have out there yeah yeah we've we've got a wealth of them that's for sure quick break for a word from our sponsor with more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roast it and ship within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste when I crack open a bag of Anglers in the morning. I feel good because I know not only does it taste great, but I am supporting great movements along the way. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we love. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to grab a bag of greatness today. That's anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change today. Well, maybe you could take us in for somebody who hasn't, and we'll we'll have a link, like I said, out there so people can listen to some of these, but maybe give us a heads up. And I know this is always a tough question because I get this sometimes as well. Like, what are the most memorable or the biggest interviews you've done? I see you have some big ones on here. Is there anything that sticks out if you had to say, hey, go listen to this one because it was really, really cool? Uh, I mean, uh, certainly Bud Lilly's interviews are always great. Bud was, uh, Bud was a good friend and a character and, uh, um, had some incredible stories to tell. So, uh, Bud Lilly's interviews, uh, we've done two with Bud, uh, were always fun. Uh, a few other folks that, that were, and I mean, all the interviews are great, but, but a few other folks that really jump out at me, uh, AK Best in his interview told a story about what fishing means to him. And, uh, it's an incredible story. I won't ruin it, but, uh, um, he really, he really sets the stage. Well, AK is, uh, AK is a, a great guy and, uh, just a real, real genuine person. Um, Pierre Effry, uh, when I was in Paris, I interviewed him at his apartment right by Pont Neuve, uh, just like a block down the road from it. And he told stories about fishing in in the 50s in, in Africa and across France. And uh, a guy who had uh, an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, fisheries in and around Europe and uh, told stories about how, you know, salmon used to run up the Seine, right? Where you could catch salmon right from the bridges in Paris. And uh, about how those are coming back now with um, with the European Common Union's rules on on clean water and how the, how important that is that even in some of the the worst worst polluted rivers over time are are coming back. And that's great. So when you go into these interviews, let's say maybe it's somebody you don't know that well, how do you approach it? What's your preparation look like when you get ready for doing one of these? So I always try to do a little research. I always try to get a little information on who I'm interviewing. We try to ask, or I try to ask a standard set of questions. And part of that is so that we have that, that data for researchers across a wide swath. So it's, I always ask people about, um, whether they've seen changes in angling, um, whether, you know, for, for better or worse, uh, how they got started angling, what it means to them. So kind of these kind of baseline questions that I ask of everybody. And then uh, uh, like Nat Reed. So Nat Reed was uh, 
um, worked uh, obviously was was a politician and an incredible environmentalist. But uh, um, I know he worked for Nixon. I know he worked for Ford, and uh, um, it really led an incredible life. But uh, asking Nat questions about what it was like to you know work in that environment and that helped us get the clean water act clean air act i mean it really did some uh incredible things and uh so i'll ask questions around somebody's area of expertise like nick Lyons. i would ask about you know the, the publishing world and uh things like that and then uh I will let the story kind of go where it goes. You know, um, one of the things that I really like is is making sure that I know enough about about the area of that person's expertise, about the environment, about the nation, if I'm overseas or, or what have you, to be able to ask the right follow-up questions. Um, the example I always give is if, if I'm interviewing somebody about angling and and they tell me, well, that was back in the time when I was hanging out a lot with Fidel Castro. I follow up on that, right? So, and I did when I, uh, uh, I did an interview several years back and, uh, God, and now that for some reason the the name is just escaping me. I was just going to say, does that does that happen to you? This happens to me because, like I said, it's at 200. When I was below 200 episodes, it felt like I could remember the number, episode number, the person. But now that I'm over it, it seems like I, I forget. Is that the case for you too? Yeah, absolutely. They will kind of, uh, I don't want to say necessarily blend for me. But uh, yeah, I'll be able to kind of recall those those little little bits and pieces and i'm sure this is going to come to me in a minute and i'll, I'll be reminded of it um but uh yeah i i absolutely will will things will will come together it can be hard to kind of to piece them out sometimes as you get more under your belt i guess but but you had somebody that was that that knew fidel or connected with fidel yeah and god i should know his name off the top of my head and i just don't and it's gonna bug me um and it'll pop out to me but anyway he showed me a picture of uh lefty cray i don't know oh, why I, why i couldn't oh, right. sure, uh, sure. grasp that but uh, uh i guess I, I turned 51 this year so uh, there you maybe go my my memory's starting to slip a little but uh yeah so you had left so you had one of that's one of the people i haven't didn't have a chance to have on what what was the what was the lefty cray like lefty was uh lefty was just just a cool guy uh, and uh in, incredibly smart i mean just just uh one of the quickest wits of every anybody I've ever met he had uh he had great jokes he had great things to great stories to tell but uh after our interview he took me up to uh, i met i interviewed him at his house and uh he took me up to his little makeshift uh kind of museum that he had of his personal artifacts and uh, he had a picture of him, Fidel Castro, and Ernest Hemingway standing <laughs> together, uh, ball with their wow. rods in their hands. And, wow, uh, that's jeez. Yeah, there you go. that's. Uh, what was the story behind that? Did he tell the story? Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, they uh, they had gone. Uh, it was a a marlin tournament that they went over for, and um, uh, left. Uh, Ernest and Fidel were fishing together, and apparently invited Lefty to join them, and. Uh, it was a it was a really cool little story, but I mean the photograph that's just yeah. Do you have that photograph? Is that somewhere out there? That is out there. That's that's not part of our collections, but uh, um, that was that was Lefty. But it has it has been preserved. Oh, it has. So I wonder yeah, yeah. I wonder where you could track that one down. Would that be in the American Museum? Maybe I believe it is at the American Museum of Fly Fishing. I could certainly double check, but I think that's where Lefty had left his his material. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind getting a. Uh link to that in the show notes just so somebody could see what that looks like if i had that photo it would be on my business card i mean it would just if if that i did uh and again i'm gonna i'm gonna fail to remember the gentleman's name but uh uh i interviewed a guy in in uh in london and uh again a really nice guy he'd written a couple things on fly fishing and uh Boy, I'm just I'm losing tracks of names today for some reason. But uh, anyway, he had met Eric Clampton in a fly fishing shop and got Eric to sign him, sign his, sign his book, saying something like "You're my hero." And uh, he took that and had it put on the back of his business card. And, Perfect. Uh, I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Oh man, that is cool. That was yeah. It's it's hard. You know, again, yeah, it's just lefty, right? You hear yeah. I've heard a lot of stories about him from people that knew him. 
and it's always the same thing. You know, it seems like the fishing is what, you know, connected him, but it's never, you always hear it's like the person, right? That's always a story yeah. you hear about how, what he was as a person, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, no, uh, Tom and Gwen told me a story about uh, going out with him uh, not long before he passed. And, uh, you know, he couldn't move around that well anymore, but he could still, you know, he could still cast with the best of them. Yeah, he could. That's the thing, the casting, right? That's one of the cool things with fly fishing is that, you know, all these other sports or a lot of these other sports, you know, snowboarding, whatever it is, you're not doing that until you're 90. But fly fishing, you know, you you can in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. Because the casting, you never lose it. No, that is... Uh... Well, some of us never get it, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying, but, uh, that's true. Well, take us back there. Let, let's go back on that. Cause we kind of missed that at the start. What, what was your, you know, how did you first get into fly fishing? Was this like early age or when did that start? No. So I didn't start fly fishing until I moved to Montana. Um, I've been growing up, uh, spinning and bait fishing. I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, one of the, my first memories of uh, fishing was uh, my mother took me to a fishing tournament on Stevenson Island, the, the border river, the Menominee River between uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Wisconsin. And uh, I still distinctly remember thinking I had a snag and uh, I caught, I don't know, maybe an 18 inch, 20 inch. It was what we called the dogfish at the time. Um, I think it might've been a carp species. I'm not really sure, but uh I still remember that. I still remember that kind of magic of, of realizing there was life on the end of my line. And, and, uh, that's, that was, I think the mystery of it is what drew me to fishing, never knowing what's tugging on the end of there. And that's what I've stuck with. But, uh, when I moved out to Montana, I was still spinning. I was interested in fly fishing and I bought a fly rod. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jason uh, Clark, had, had told me to uh, set up a hula hoop in my yard and, and cast to that. And uh, so I tried that, but didn't have a lot of luck. And uh, I was telling Bud about this, and he said, let's go out. And so uh, uh, he took me out a, a little place on the, we weren't on the, uh, we were on the Gallatin. Um, and uh, he took me out and uh, gave me some tricks to casting and uh uh, gave me some really good tips on on how to read the water, where the fish were going to be, and and uh, sure enough, every time I was able to land a cast where Bud wanted me to put it, a fish would rise. That's pretty cool. Wait, what was the? Do you remember the one of those tips that he gave you about fishing? One of my favorite tips that he gave me about fishing was he said, "Jim, the 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 well, I'll give you two of them, but one of them was Jim. The fish don't know whether you're using a nine hundred dollar rod or a ninety dollar rod. It's uh." You know, it's, it's, uh, sometimes as anglers, we can certainly tell the difference and don't get me wrong. I'd love to be able to afford a, a 900 or $9,000 rod, but it's, it's not in my budget right now. And, uh, the other advice he gave me was, he said, for the most times, uh, for the most part, fish strike for two reasons. They're, they're hungry or they're pissed. There you go. <laughs> and Bud now is Bud, is he alive still? No, Bud passed, uh, several years back, uh, Esther just passed, uh, I believe, two years ago now, a year and a half ago. Um, yeah, no, Bud was a well, Bud was a good friend. I was actually at a conference in Sri Lanka um, when when Bud died, but I was so happy. I was able to uh, I was able to work it out. I, I actually got a taxi driver who had a um, a tuk tuk driver who had an international card because my cell phone wouldn't work over there and i was able to pay him to be able to use his phone so i was able to call back call the hospital and uh speak with esther and be able to say goodbye to bud and uh i was always really grateful that i was able to do that because he was uh he was a really important guy in my life and so was esther i stayed up with esther until she passed i still stay in touch with uh chris their youngest son and uh we're just good people Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and Bud is obviously a huge name out in that area. He, we know the guys at the, um, at Big Sky, right? They think they purchased Bud where Bud's shop used to be sure. there. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a history, right? I mean, these Bud created uh, something there that was, that's living on right past him, which is something I think a lot of us probably wish that we could do. Do you feel like, you know, like when you look at what you have going with this, oral you know everything you have going here is that i mean what keeps you going here what is that the thing for you you're thinking like wow i'm really documenting these connections with these people that some people would, would never know about 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like if I've done anything in, in my career or my life that will uh, kind of have a legacy and leave something behind me, it's the work I've done with the Trout and Salmonic Collection. It's uh, the work that uh, um, creating this oral history project and uh, being able to apply for grants to be able to fund it, especially for the travel, to be able to do these interviews in places where I truly believe a lot of this information would not have been documented. Um, you know, just in, in Maritas and Sierra Leone and, and kind of really places off the beating track. But uh, um, yeah, I, I think leaving that behind and leaving this wealth of information, not only on, on angling, but um, kind of on the connections of angling, why we fish, fish health, climate change i mean just kind of documenting this on on really a global scale plus what's been really cool about it is that i've been to, able to travel quite a bit so i've been able to fish some really cool spots i've had some really interesting adventures angling and uh been able to actually catch fish on six continents now so. oh wow well what's one of those spots that's kind of you you wouldn't think that's maybe kind of remote and that you fished and that's memorable so th there's certainly a, a few rivers I'd fish part of the White Nile um, in Uganda. And uh, it was it was incredible. But uh, I mean, it was really good fishing, um, fishing for Nile perch there. I also uh, um, fished Lake Victoria there and, and did catch an oil perch there. But uh, um, I've had some good luck. But a lot of it so much like I think for all of us. And one of the things that really comes across in the angling oral histories is fishing is part of it right but it's also about being there it's also about you know seeing the seeing the birds in the sky you know smelling the flowers uh uh just the general experience of being in nature um is is so important and i, I think that's as much of a draw for fishing as anything especially with those of us who who primarily do catch and release right it's no longer about harvesting that meal it's not about about taking that fish home. It's about being out there. It's, and that's, uh, I think, uh, oh gosh, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, my, my brain is, is slipping on the name, but one of my favorite quotes is, uh, uh, maybe, maybe fishing for me was just an excuse to be near ver rivers. And if so, I'm glad I thought about it. It was Hey right. Brown. Oh, Hey, hey Brown. Brown. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, some of the stories that I've heard from people about how the things they've seen out, angling and uh and so i think for a lot of us too it's it's as much about that connection to to family and friends right uh dan wank who was a superintendent of yellowstone um told me a story about what fishing means to him and what really struck home or what really got me about it was he talked about it's so much less about the fishing for him now it's about being out there but it's also about connecting to those times that his grandfather or father or brothers or people who are no longer around went out with us, you know, the, and, uh, having those memories and kind of refreshing that in our, in our minds about those special moments that we shared with the people we loved in these places that we love. And somehow that being there makes that memory stronger. Um, I think Norman McLean wrote at the end of uh, a river runs through it about the, the water rushing over the rocks and the words under the rocks and that some of the words were theirs. And, you know, I think, um, he was really talking about that, that connection that we all have to, to family, to those that we love in these places that we love. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I always, the river runs through it has such a, a Norman McLean. Did you ever talk to him? So I didn't talk to Norman. I did talk to his son and was able to interview his son. And I have been able to one of my, one of my claims to fame, if I have any, is that I was able to visit the cabin on Sealy Lake, and I was able to sit there and read part of a river runs through it while I was there, which was, I mean, I'm surrounded by pictures of uh, Norman and his brother and his, his, his parents, and uh, knowing that, you know, they had all sorts of fishing adventures in this spot where I was sitting was, was a really cool thing. Oh, wow. That is cool. So why, so Uganda, what, what took you to Uganda? So I had actually presented at a conference over there and then I, I bounced around a little bit and, uh, did some interviews. Um, so I've interviewed, done quite a few interviews in, in Africa and, uh, um, throughout Asia, um, uh, Africa. So wherever 
I would say wherever the British went, there's trout. Right, and I was going to say, yeah, there's so there Uganda has actually trout. Yeah, yeah, there, there's, uh, there's. So these trout. aren't native. So you're not documenting that where the native uh, distribution of trout. It's no, 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 yeah. no. I mean, I certainly have done that in a lot of places. Uh, um, done some interviews in Mexico, Canada, across Europe. You know, really focusing on native fish and uh, native fish or trout are really special to me. But of course, some of our best angling and some of our most fangling, famous angling is in the southern hemisphere where there are no native species or trout or salmonids. And so, uh, you know, I've documented a lot of that as well. But um, uh, South Africa, they, they love their trout fishing. There are trout in some of the, the national parks in Ethiopia, um, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, and uh, some... The, the interviews I did there, I think I did about a dozen interviews when I was there. And uh, I actually, that was where I caught malaria. So those were some of the hardest interviews I've ever oh, wow. done. But it was, uh, it was pretty cool. It was, uh, it was great hearing their stories. It was great hearing their stories about uh, kind of how things have changed over time from, you know, like from when it used to be Rhodesia. And uh, I always really enjoy hearing people's stories and hearing about kind of uh, the story of them. Uh, what I always tell people for archives is that, yeah, we're interested in, you know, the reason why we're, we're probably talking and why we're interested in your papers is your connecting, connection to angling or fishing or what have you. But, but an archival collection really tells the story of a person. It's about them. We want somebody to be able to look at these papers in 50 or 100 or 200 years, or as long as there's an MSU for that matter, that uh, will help tell the story of who that person was and unfiltered, you know, the good, the bad, et cetera. And um, in some ways, these interviews, when we talk about asking people about what fishing means to them or how they got started or what they love about it, it tells a little story about them. And uh, and I think preserving that, we're, we're doing something important and i think that uh the idea of preserving these for future generations um i've had multiple uh, on several different occasions i've had people reach out to me that their their father or their mother or their uncle has since passed and uh they wanted a copy of this interview or they wanted to link back to it from the obituary or they wanted to show a part of it at the at the wake because this was the only film that they had of them actually kind of talking and smiling and being relaxed. And, uh, yeah, so I, I I've always, I've always really been, been that's touched cool. by that. By Yeah. That's really cool. I think that, uh, yeah, I kind of look at the same thing, like what we're doing. Right. I mean, I just enjoy the interviews, you know, it's just like, like this one is just like the other, you know, whatever we've done, 400 we've done. It's, it's just fun to hear the story and your story is, you know, they're all good, whether you're like lefty cray or if you're just getting started fly fishing, right? It's always because it's a human story. I think is and is that what it is for you? I guess you just said it, right? But that's, yeah. that's it. It's the person. No, no, I absolutely agree. It is it is the human story. And uh and I mean some of them are, you know, even the the first stories. I interviewed a young gentleman a a few years back who he had to be I had to get his parents' permission to interview him. I think he was fourteen or fifteen, but he told me a story about the first trout he ever caught was on a fly he tied and a rod he built how cool is that you know that cool. i mean those are some cute cool little little human stories that uh i think get mixed in there and sometimes you don't and sometimes our, our best stories are the ones I'm, I'm guessing you've seen this too that you don't expect to find bear vault is one way to assure your next backcountry trip stays memorable epic and safe Bear Vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister that keeps bears and other wild animals away from your food. This in turn keeps your food safe, keeps the bears safe, and keeps you safe. I've got a classic story that I told. I've told a few times about the bear taking my backpack while up in Alaska. I had my lunch and some snacks in there and just went up around the corner to fish for a bit. When I got back, it was uh, totally gone. If I would have had that Bear Vault, Right at that moment, I would have been okay because my food would have been completely sealed. The bear would have had no idea and no reason to take my backpack. So a good reminder there. You might not realize it, but this type of thing happens all the time, even to experienced outdoorsmen. The great news for us is now we can experience the great stuff of a remote trip without ever having to worry about animals fiddling with our stuff. 
Sleep soundly knowing your vault has sealed the deal for you. Believe it or not, food storage is a key consideration while backcountry hiking, fishing, or camping. The Bear Vault also has some great bonus features like the see-through sidewall so you can find your stuff really easy and a large opening plus it doubles as a nice camp stool. This thing is legit. It definitely is one of my, this might be my favorite feature is, is the camp stool. You know, I love a good, a good chair out there. Check in with the crew at Bear Vault at wetflyswing.com slash Bear Vault. That's Bear Vault, B-E-A-R-V-A-U-L-T. Okay, back to the show. Right on. Well, I, and I was just, you know, going back, I was just trying to make sure we capture your story, you know, again, because you talked about it, you were kind of out in Wisconsin and remind us again. So if you're, so how did you get out to, uh, to Bozeman? Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I was, uh, so I, I grew up in Wisconsin. I, I got my graduate degrees in Wisconsin. Um, I had applied for a job at, at Montana state at MSU Bozeman, Montana state university Bozeman, uh, as a reference librarian. And, um, they, uh, flew me out, offered me the gig and, uh, that's how I got, that's how I came out to Bozeman. Um, I had passed through there once in college, a, a buddy of mine and I took a road trip out to Olympic national park and, uh, just us and our dogs, my old dog Buster and his dog Tigger, both of whom are, are past now. But, uh, um, and we stopped in Bozeman. I remember thinking, wow, this is a cool place. This would be a cool place to live. And, uh, uh, when I saw the job come up, I applied and I I was lucky enough to get it. And, and that's what brought me out to Montana. And, and that's largely what's kept me out there. I, I, it's a, it's a beautiful state, uh, great fishing. We get 300 days of sunshine a year. I, I live about a, it's, it's become more expensive, but I live about an hour outside of campus in an off grid home that I built myself. So, uh, it's, uh, Montana has a, a lot of a lot of good adventures to offer, and uh, I met some uh, I've met some incredible people out there, and uh, uh, made some good friends, and and caught some really good fish. That's really cool. I got to I got to hear about this off grid home. This sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> What's uh, was that something where you just have the skills of, uh, or did you just start something, kind of read some blogs and go for it? So that's exactly what I did. Was I just kind of uh, I read up on it a little bit. I mean. Uh, uh, my old stepdad had, uh, he, when I was a kid, uh, Earl had taught me how to use, uh, some power tools and things like that. And my uncle had a farm and worked a little bit on that, but never really, you know, never really did much carpentry, but, uh, I, I made a decision that it was something that I wanted to do. And, uh, my theory was always, if I couldn't think of a reason why it wouldn't work, I'd give it a shot. And that didn't always play out, but, uh, for the most part it did, um, yeah, built my my first home there by scratch uh, using a lot of uh, recycled material. So I did a lot of dumpster diving and things like that for uh, for salvage and wood. Uh, I remember my first shower was I found a bunch of old street signs behind one of the dorms one day that that uh, I'm sure were up in a student's room or what have you. But uh, I used those to line my first shower. I figured, oh well, they're waterproof; they will work. So and they did. Wow, but. Um, <laughs> But learn the difference between uh, solar and wind, and and uh, especially in Montana, we don't uh, our most of our water we get in the spring, so you got to be be careful with that if you're not digging a well. And uh, I did all rain catchment for my water, but wow. uh, so no well, it's all no all well, rain. yeah. So I'd recycle the water from my uh, my uh, sinks in my shower, and that's what I'd use. Uh, for the toilet so i'd use the gray water for the toilet and that would be what go went to the septic um but yeah all rain catchment rain catchment is just about the idea of the old saying making hay while the sun shines it's just about being able to collect enough water while it rains to be able to get you through um the one tip i'd have for anybody in montana who's looking to go off grid is is the the sun shines 300 days a year um panels are are a better bet than a windmill at least in montana oh, yeah and our panels getting i you know i mean panels have been out there for a while now but it is the tech there now that it's just even better is it getting better and better it's it's getting better and better and what's and it's uh getting cheaper and cheaper which is uh really nice i think when the first panels i bought i want to say i paid about three or four dollars a watt um now i can get it for about 50 cents a watt 
and so it's uh it's it's come way down in price if anybody's thinking about going off grid uh the other advice i'd have is always go with more panels and more batteries than you think you'll need right 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 gosh that's amazing so you so everything is out there and and how many how many square feet are you uh powering or or are you living in there uh about 1100 square feet and um uh, and I mean, it's, it's for the most part, it's, it's just like living on, on grid. There's, there's not a whole lot of difference. You try to stay away from things like, so I have a shaved head. So it's, yeah. Microwaves, hair dryers. I was going to say my shaved head, I don't need one, but, uh, you know, things that, that draw a lot of resistive heat. Uh, obviously you have a gas stove, not an electric stove. Uh, but you know, I mean, I've got a 50 inch TV, I've got a big double door French freezer fridge, you know, it's, uh, it's just about being conscious and doing the little things, you know, I mean, all the lights should be led and, you know, you save, save power where you can, uh, on demand hot water heater. So you're not using, you're only using that, that power when, when you're actually using hot water. But Right. And, and are there people around you that are on the grid? No, no, I'm uh, I'm uh, about five miles or so from the grid. So, uh, yeah, but uh, oh, yeah, all my neighbors are off grid, and uh, it's a real welcoming community. And so uh, they were really able to help me kind of get in the idea of of what to do. One of my when I built a greenhouse, one of my neighbors was he uh, had had worked on aquaponics, and it's initial phases and he gave me some great tips as did my uncle who has a farm on greenhouses uh they said build them high you want the heat to have a place to go and i never really thought about that but uh you know it's all about that tempered zone where the plants live and uh uh, so little tips like that have have been great and um but yeah for the most part it's it's like uh and uh, with today's technology, uh, with Starlink and, and other oh, internet right. services, yeah. and you what's can his get, name? Elon Musk and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. you can get internet pretty much anywhere you are, which is nice. And, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, that's so cool. It reminds me, you know, in Montana again, you know, we, you hear so much about it, you know, it's, it's always the fly fishing, one of the top places you hear about and but you also hear about like Bo is it Bose Angeles is that kind of one of the names you hear that, that is uh I've seen it grown remarkably <laughs> in the last but you still have the, it sounds like you still have these places like there's still plenty of lots of wild space it's not right it's not oh yeah like, no yeah no we've still got lots of uh we've still got lots of space in Montana we've still got uh, I think we're the second or third largest state and uh we're 48 or somewhere in there in terms of population uh one of our old senators i'm not a huge fan of him but he but he did have a great quote that was uh something like there's a lot of dirt between light bulbs in montana oh, <laughs> that's yeah yeah it's still not there's not a lot of people yeah it's a similar it's probably i mean i'm not sure if you've been up to alaska or whatever but i'm sure there's a similar type of person that you know wants to live right like you you're living off the grid i mean it takes a certain person to be able to live off the grid it is one of those things where you just have to, once you accept it, it's all right. But you have that idea where every problem is your problem. You know, when my mom would come out to visit, she she sometimes couldn't understand why nobody would come to plow the road or things like that. And it's, you know, you have to go back to, uh, yeah, you, you have to be a self-starter. You have to be uh, kind of willing to, okay, my light's not turning around. Okay, what could it be? And you 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 trace that back. But but I'm a believer that anybody who wanted to could do this. And uh, part of it is even taking those small steps like, you know, the on-demand hot water heaters and, and things like that can make a huge difference. But Yeah, perfect. Good. Well, that uh, takes us back a little bit of your story. So basically, I mean, you got there, you got to MSU and, uh, and I mean, that, the rest is history, right? You met Bud Lilly and, uh, and fly fishing. I mean, when you look ahead now at what you have going you know, what does that look like? Do you see some new things coming up or just more interviews? It looks like you do about out of 360, you've done, you know, like roughly 36 per year, just roughly averaging it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that's, you know, almost one a week, not quite, but, uh, yeah, are you going to keep on the same track and just producing content? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to keep on. This, yeah, we're we're going to grow the collection um, actively, seeking those kind of underrepresented voices, like we talked about earlier in the hour. You know, women, um, 
other folks that that maybe aren't as represented and then of course you know the rock stars if i get a chance to interview michael keaton or oprah or somebody else who fishes i certainly will but you will uh, right yeah yeah our one of our claims to fame is uh is uh, i love to throw this one out because it was such a fun episode but uh, henry winkler Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's down. Actually, he fishes down south, I think, in Idaho. He does that every year. Yeah. So that was, that was an interesting interview. And that was one that was probably one of my most, you know, um, anxious interviews, right? Because it's the fawns. Yeah and, yeah. and you don't want to screw it up. And, but it was really cool. Yeah. We talked about fishing and, and he talked about what fly fishing meant to him, right? And, and then we got into a little bit of his new show, you know, Barry, which you want to Emmy, sure. which is kind of a crazy show. No, that's great. I've heard he's yeah. a really cool guy. He's got a book. I think it's called "I've I've Never Met an Idiot on the River" or something. That's like right. That. That's right. Yep. Yeah, we talked about that, and uh, we talked. Yeah, he's just a super cool guy. Yeah, and there's a few of those big names you mentioned. You know, Eric Clapton's out there. There's definitely some people. Fly fishing is. Um, I don't. I don't know what it is. It's just uh, not everybody does it. But once you do it, it seems like you kind of most people get addicted to it. Do, yeah. do you kind of feel that way? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, I'll just throw one out there too, of, uh, cool celebrities that I've met, uh, Jeremy Wade, uh, the river monsters guy. Oh yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. I, I got to go fishing with Jeremy. I know him a little bit. Uh, he was our, our lecturer. We also do an annual lecture series at the, at the university. Um, so we've had, um, Oh, Nat Reed was a speaker one year when, uh, Jeremy, but anyway, uh, Jeremy was, one of the most down to earth, coolest people I've I've ever met in terms of I I hosted him when he was in Bozeman. You know, we'd go out to lunch, we'd go out and and hang out, and everywhere we went, people were coming up to him. Hey, can I get an autograph? Hey, can I get a picture? As gracious of a guy as could be with that. Yeah, Jeremy. And and what did you guys go fishing for some river monsters? Uh, I mean, we went fishing for some browns. I don't know that you'd call them river monsters, but uh, uh, during his talk, he did show a, a picture of uh, oh, a little, I think it was a little caddis slide versus one of the hooks he normally uses when he's like on the oh, Amazon right. or something. And yeah. It was a pretty big disparity, but uh, he's a, he's a, he's a well-educated guy. He's written quite a bit on fishing as well. And uh uh, one of the things that he did in his talk, which I was a little surprised by, but he opened it by apologizing. He said, I, I know my show makes it look like you can still go to all these kind of back corners of the world and just land these big, huge fish. And he said, that's it's harder and harder. He said, you know, uh, climate change, pollution, things we're doing as as humans are affecting fishing on a global scale. And that's something we should all be concerned about. But uh, it was... Uh, a cool little message to to give to uh, the student. He spoke to a lot of our students. So nice, nice, good. Well, and I just had one more note here. I was going to check with you. So yeah, I mean, I'm obviously with the podcasting. It's just a type, and probably my guess is five, ten years, twenty years from now, there'll be something else. Right? It might not be called podcast anymore. But it is the oral, right? Is the long form interview. Do you find, I mean, where else can you find these long form interviews like this? I mean, not just fly fishing, but it seems like those are going, have been going away. Do you, do you feel that's the same? I think in some respects they are. I think part of it is kind of uh, the change in media, right? Um, we're much more about, as a society in some respects, I think we're more about the sound bite than, than kind of the long, the deep dive, so to speak, I guess. But um, yeah, they're certainly still out there. There are a lot of archives like ours and, and many others, AMFF, uh, um, a lot of organizations that are looking to, to preserve this knowledge for future generations. That's, that's what archives do really is the idea of that, that we want to create a snapshot of not only our time, but, but, you know, times before us and preserve that, keep that around for future generations. So um yeah, we're, our plan is to keep doing that as long as there's a Montana State University out there to do it at. And can people download when they go to listen? I mean, they can get copies of like periodicals, right? You send mm -hmm. them books or whatever. Can people actually download the videos or the, you know, the, the interviews? I believe you can. And, uh, and certainly we can arrange for that to happen if somebody's interviewed in the interviews or if somebody's interested in the interviews. This is something that uh, we will be happy to share these with anybody who's interested. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's really awesome. I mean, basically, you're a, it's a, um, 
yeah, I mean, essentially a, a free resource, right? For I mean, that's your idea. I mean, what is the mission? What is the like? What is when you come down? You know, at the essence of what you do uh, for maybe explain that just briefly. Sure. To uh, I can sum it up pretty quickly. It's really about preserving the global history and culture of angling. And uh, that's what we want to do through these interviews is uh, preserve these stories, preserve these knowledge. Um, uh, worst case is a snapshot of what was, but, you know, otherwise just really kind of to share that, that rich history of angling and to keep it out there for future generations. Perfect. And you want to give a quick heads up on, you know, now we're kind of in March going into April here pretty soon. What you have coming in the next kind of the rest of this year, anything new or you want to give a shout out to? Yeah. So we, we always do our lecture series. That'll be coming up in the fall. Um, our last one was with, with Jim Getz, who was really instrumental in getting us uh, fishing access and preserving our fishing access in the state of Montana. That's something we're always working on. Uh, this fall, I'm going to be teaching a uh, a class at the university on uh, on using archives, on angling, and uh, the history of it. And part of that will accumulate with a, uh, we're going to go down to Belize for about 10 days oh, and wow. uh, go check out some of the fishing down there, hopefully get a line in the water, maybe for some permit, tarpon, or uh, bonefish. Oh, there you go. So. There you go. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty good gig. So, good. Yeah, okay, I, well, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll send everybody out to... Um, like we said earlier, I guess just like you said, search Angling Oral History Project, Montana State University. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I mean, feel free to uh, link back to my email. If anybody has direct questions for me, feel free to reach out anytime. I'll be I'll be happy to help with any of the information we have. And if you just want a tip on where's good to get a line in the water around Bozeman, I'm happy to help with that as well. Okay. Per- and you, uh, you go by Jim or James or both? Six of one. Yeah. Yeah. I go by both. So perfect. All right. All right. Well, we called you James at the start, so we'll leave it off with James, uh, James, uh, Thule. uh, I appreciate you coming on today and shedding some light on what you have going. It's a, it's an amazing, um, body of work. You know, I, I remember we interviewed John Garrick as well. And, uh, and I remember asking him some of that, you know, some of that stuff, like, what is it? Um, you know, the whole thing, right? What does it mean to him? And it was really interesting. I think it is about the body of work, right? It's not about any one interview or anything you do. Do you you feel that for you? That's what it is. You look back at this whole thing you've created because it really has been you, right? I mean, there's, I've had a lot of support, but, uh, um, yeah, Bud and I definitely kind of came up with the idea to do it. So, um, I, I've certainly played a part, I would say, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's been great, and I agree. It is it is about the larger body of work, and uh, um, I think a lot like you do with your your four hundred plus interviews and in, in documenting that. And uh, I think we've you mentioned uh, you mentioned John. I think you've interviewed Bruce Staples, a few other folks. Uh, um, my guess is we've our wires have crossed more than once already. But that's uh, right. But I think it's really important what you're doing as well and getting that stuff out there and uh, preserving that and allow people to learn more about angling and uh, also be able to kind of preserve that knowledge for folks. So, so well done. All right. Yeah. Thanks, James. All right. We'll keep in touch with you and we will talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. There we go. Wetflyswing.com slash 452. 452. Check it out right now. You can get the show notes, find out, uh, get some links over to see some of those amazing guests. I'm sure we'll have a link to the the Lefty Cray interview there and whatever else we can uh, we can add to it. Check it out right now. Quick reminder before we get out of here, uh, you can join the live event tonight on Facebook where we're going to announce the Skeena Spay Lodge winner and the big prize pack. See who won this massive uh, this trip and the products. And, uh, and we're likely going to be giving away some bonus products as well tonight. So check it out right now for a chance to win some bonus. Uh, some the, And this isn't just hats and stickers. we got some good stuff we're, uh, we're giving away tonight. Check it out. Wetflyswing.com slash live. Quick listeners, shout out before we hop out of here as well tonight, Rick Wagner. All right, I got a quick one from Rick Wagner. He checked in. Rick has been a listener for a while here. And he checked in and said, uh, Dave, loved your interview with the great John Girock. There we go. I love it. Short and sweet and to the point, John Girock. Uh, that was one of my favorites. I'm going to hopefully get John on in a future episode um, if we can moving forward. 
So thanks, uh, Rick, for checking in here and uh, and for giving us a uh, some love there, and I appreciate that. If you want to get a shout out, you can check in with me, Dave at wetflyswing.com anytime, or uh, or on social media, and just let me know. Uh, email is easy. If you could do that, and uh, and I'll give you a shout out, and I'll put together an episode for you as well. All right, let's take a quick look tonight at the live event. We are going to be turning around tomorrow, and we're jumping right back into it. Um, we are heading in with the traveled program and then we're jumping in on the next episode to wrap it up this week. So stay tuned. It's a big week and I hope you can connect with me, maybe online or on the water. If you're a winner of this trip, or if you just want to straight up and pick up a slot, we're going to have a limited number of spots to pay and head over to the Skeena Spay Lodge. And, uh, and I think we have the early bird special going on right now. You can check that out. Wetflyswing.com slash school. At school, S-C-H-O-O-L, school. Check it out and find out if you want to grab a slot. Check it out. Just enter your email name and we'll follow up with you and let you know if we have any availability still. Uh, this is the time. It's going to be going quick for this one. All right. I hope you're having a good evening, a good morning, or a good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate you for stopping in today. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.